I'm Joita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. Art is never just a representation of the world. Art is, moreover, an interpretation and a reimagining of the world around us. This is why the idea of a blind visual artist isn't all that surprising. Granted, at first glance, it seems a little odd. How can someone who can see possibly represent the world on canvas? But color is not just seen, it can also be felt. Some artists see color when they hear sound. The rigid lines between our senses and perceptions isn't so rigid after all. Although we most often look at art, that too from a distance, it's possible to experience art more fully by engaging other senses besides vision. Today, we discuss art and perception. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI Audio. I'm Joita Gupta and I'm joining you from the Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. I'm wearing a shirt with a round neck and it has a short sleeves and it's sort of a greenish turquoise color, uh, depending on the light. And um, in today's episode, we are talking to yet another blind painter. I had such a great conversation with Clark Reynolds that it left me wanting more. And I'm really delighted to welcome John Bramlett to the program. John is an award-winning blind visual artist. He is also the author of the book, Shouting in the Dark. John is joining us today from Denton, Texas, where he lives with his family. Hello again, John. It's so, it's so great to have you on the show. I, I, I'm really pumped that you could join us today. Well, hi there. Then thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'm so happy to be here. All right, I'm going to skip over the. Oh my God, you're blind and you paint a bit uh, because I'm sure you get asked. Uh, there's a lot of surprise when that happens because I know there are a number of people. I've myself have talked to about three or four people who are blind and they and they do visual art. So I've gotten over the surprise of it, but I find that for each person that I talk to, their process is very different. So I'm going to start there. How, how do you go about painting as someone who is blind? Well, I started over 20 years ago, and, um, and I, I, when I, I lost my eyesight in college, and, but I had done art all my life. So before I lost the eyesight, I, I could do the, the, the blueprints for houses, and I could draw portraits and all these different things. And then in college, when I lost the eyesight, you start learning how to do everything in new ways, and you, you learn how to eat, how to cook how to read and write in new ways, just everything. And one of the main things though, is how to get around, how to, how to navigate the world, you know, how to get around a, a, your room or a city. And I started learning how to use the white cane. And then later a guide dog, my, my guide dog Eagle is snoring underneath me right now. <laughs> but, um, but, but after about a year, I could leave my little college apartment and I, I could travel the short distance to the university and, and do it by myself. Up, up till then, I would have a sighted guide. So I thought, well, good grief! If I if I can travel a um, if I can travel by myself and do this, then maybe I can start. I can travel across a canvas. When I first started, there wasn't really a, blind painters wasn't a thing. Like there was a guy in Turkey, there was me. There might have been a couple others that we didn't know about. And so I, I thought it was out of my mind. I, I thought this was just a crazy thing. This is twenty something years ago, and I am. Um, but I started navigating across the canvas the same way that I navigate across the city using lines that I can touch and feel. So I started coming up with techniques for people without vision to be able to draw and coming up with lots of them and in different ways to handle color. And I've, I've trained hundreds, if not thousands of visually impaired people to paint over the years. So what is your technique? You'll have to excuse me um, because I, I love asking these nitty gritty questions. Uh, would you put down paint or like, do you, like how exactly do you actually know where you're applying paint on the canvas? Through touch really. So, so when I first started, I would have paint that was really thick. So I would have giant thick lines. And it's the same way if you're using a cane, you can feel the, the sidewalk, you can feel the cracks. You got all this texture. Well, it's the same with a painting. I, I could I could draw lines that I could touch and feel. Over the years, though, it's it changed a little bit. Um, um, so I have different ways that I can draw. 
So I have some techniques now that I can use lines that aren't raised, but they just feel different. They might be tacky or they're slick or they're, they just feel different than the, than the area around them. But that makes it where it's opened up lots of techniques. And um, 2017, I became the world's first blind mur muralist. And I started doing murals in New York, Dallas, painted a 737. But with all these, I had to use different sorts of, of techniques. Then I couldn't use the giant thick lines that I used to use because it would fall off the building or it, would, you know, it just wouldn't work. But that was one of the things. This, you know, I love that about art, though, is that it's about what you can do. And you just, you know, it doesn't matter what you can't do. It just doesn't even enter the equation. So you have a problem. You either something that you want to accomplish or you want to do. And you just find different techniques to work in that problem. And I'm just fascinated by art. It's just incredible. Every day is different with it. So how much, how much art do you do in a day? If you say that every day is different, how much time do you devote to art in a day? And how can one day be different from the other? I paint at least eight hours a day, but usually it's more like 14. And um, I have a gallery, a studio that I work in, and I have a home studio, which I'm in right now. Um, and so I'm going to leave here in my home studio. I've been painting all night. And then I'm going to go and paint in my in my gallery, and I'll paint all day. And then, and so actually, we'll probably be painting until about 2 a.m. tonight there because we're having some events. And so but I invite people in my studio to paint. And that's one of the things that makes it different in my studio it's a space for people to come in and make art as well. And they can paint with me or we can do different things. So having other people come in and, and, you know, and sharing their experiences and seeing how they make art. Well, I learn every day that, that I'm talking to other artists and working with other artists and I'm always trying out new techniques. And, and so every day is a little different. Every day is, 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 it's just wonderful with, with art. You never, you're, you're never an expert with it. There's always something that there is to learn. There's always something to try. It's something to, um, to fail at. There's lots and lots of mistakes, lots of failures with it. And that's the wonderful thing. Wait, wait, you said you want to fail at art? Uh, because I know of a lot of artists who are really, uh, I don't want to say that they're hard on themselves. No, wait, I, I do want to say that they're hard on themselves. They don't want to fail. They want the perfect masterpiece. And you hear you are saying failing is a good thing. What's going on there? <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> when I first started, I didn't like failing at all. But um, you know, it, it's funny if you're not if you're not failing from time to time, then you're probably not trying enough new things. You know, like you're in a rut. You're just sort of doing the same thing over and over. And in art, my favorite my my favorite part of my home studio, um, I have a big rack that's right in front of me, behind my the camera, but I call it the rack of shame because it's pa it's paintings that were so bad. I couldn't even use the canvas anymore. They're just the texture; it's too thick, and it's all crazy. But with every one of them, though, I learned something, and I love art. I love learning about art, and every, every with every one of those, I have a lesson that I learned, and it pushed me to be better at something, and it pushed me to to, to try different techniques. And the thing that I love about painting is actually the act of painting. Like my favorite painting is always the painting that I'm working on, because you know it, it's the one that's, that's taking me out of myself when I'm. Painting. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm not worried about the past. I'm in the moment, and I'm learning in the moment. And even when I have a, a failure, it's getting me a step closer to where I want to be. So if I do a painting and it works, then that's great. It's a success. If I don't, then I'm still a step closer to where I want to be. <laughs> so either way, I'm getting there. You know, um, they say about writers that if you want to be a good writer, you have to be a reader. And so I would wonder if in order to be a good painter or to evolve as a painter, you need to be exposed to other people's artwork. Is that something that you struggle with as someone who, uh, who delves with visual art? That while your art may be accessible to a sighted audience, you may not have the same level of access as a blind patron of the arts to um, the work of other artists that most of the audience is able to see. Is that something that you struggle with or do you take it in stride? You know, um, I, I don't really struggle with this. And, um, and it, but it's, that's such a great point though that you made because that's something that I've been working at for about 15 years. Making, um, I, I work with museums. So I work with the, the Metropolitan. I work with the Guggenheim, the, the Kennedy Center. I'm all on staff for the Kennedy Center. I work with museums all over the country and have for about 15 years, I'm helping them become more inclusive and making it so that anyone that comes into the museum can access the art. And and I'm fortunate because because I, I've been doing that since college, really. And 
Um, and the, when I was still in college doing that, and the, I get to touch a lot of artwork. <laughs> I get to touch some Van Goghs and Monets and, and have it verbally described to me. So so I'm really lucky with that. But but it's something that I've worked really hard at, at making sure that there's access for everyone so that whenever you come in, there's things for people to to engage all, all of the senses, like the multimodal programs, multi-century or something that I started coming up with and working with years and years ago and it's spread all over the country and people are teaching it all over the country so that wherever you go in like if you if you ever go to a workshop and to a museum and you're and you're touching things you're smelling things and you're and you're going around that's something that we started like you know years ago and um and we just have been doing it and teaching it and we've been te- working with museums all over the world really to to do this and the incredible thing about it is that you can go to a conference and you can teach a whole room full of museum curators and stuff these techniques and they're free. It's just information. You know, it's like, oh, well, when you're doing a tour, you should have a really good verbal description. <laughs> you should have some things for people to touch, things for people to smell. Um, I've done workshops in museums where maybe we're covering art and, and dance. And so I'll actually have dancers come in and dance so everybody can see them or hear them and they'll, they'll, they'll explain the movements. Um, we'll try to incorporate sculpture into the artwork. So we'll find sculpture in the museum that mimics some of the paintings so that if you're visually impaired, you you can feel the, the cubist designs or you can feel the different sort the different types of art. So then whenever it's described in the painting, you have that tactile memory. Maybe you know exactly what that painting looks like, but the style and just you know, just trying to make things more accessible. So um maybe a struggle is a good word. Maybe that's but that's that's been my favorite thing. I'm a studio artist. Mostly, what I do is I paint. I do work on commissions. I do murals. But my absolute favorite thing, like the icing on the cake, is actually traveling and going, and giving talks, and working with museums and working with schools, and actually getting there and and bringing art to people. and 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 the best the best experience I have is whenever I go in and a room of, of people with disabilities or or, or visual people without vision to bring art and they're 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 painting for the first time or drawing for the first time and it's like this light bulb is going off and it's just it's just incredible i don't know it's my favorite thing are people self-conscious like i'm thinking about sighted people who might take your workshops because and you'll forgive me if, if the assumption is wrong that the majority of the people you work with i mean i'm sure they're visually impaired people and people with disabilities but a lot of people are actually sighted who might be introduced to your way of of making art um you know maybe they have a blindfold on or what have you do people feel self-conscious about the idea that they're actually painting without seeing because that idea about you know staring at the canvas and painting is so deeply rooted in our imagination that I think many, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm conjecturing here, but I suspect many blind people wouldn't even take up painting because it's, it's or visual art, because it the, because this it's such a deeply entrenched idea that you have to be able to see in order to paint. Of course, you're debunking it every day, but. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, you know, when I first started, I really thought I was out of my mind because there weren't blind painters. Like, it wasn't a, a thing. And I, but art had always been why I grew up and I, was, I had a lot of health problems. I, I, I was born with epilepsy. That developed a severe epilepsy and had kidney problems and had to have the kidney removed by the time I was seven and ended up getting Lyme's disease and in these massive seizures where it was making my heart stop and my breathing stop and that's what I lost about 40 percent of my hearing and all of my vision and then some other little neuro- neurological problems and but art though growing up I think I could draw before I could walk and art was just my way of dealing with all of that it just if, you, if I was having a bad day I, I, or if I was in the hospital, I would, drawing was my way of dealing with that. It made a bad day better. And art is a great way to celebrate a good day. So bad day or good day, I drew every day. I think I could draw before I could walk and I drew every day all the way up until I lost my eyesight. And then I didn't think I'd ever be able to draw again until about a year later that I started using those cane techniques to start figuring it out. But I really thought I was out of my mind. I thought this was just crazy. And, um, and so, but... It's, you know, I, I I just had to do something. I was so angry and I was so depressed and I just needed art. I, I never thought anybody would ever see a painting of mine. It wasn't even a thought. I just, I needed to be able to get out of that depression. Um, but I, I've been, I was so, I, I was so surprised whenever I did my first shows, I didn't tell people I was visually impaired. I would hang the shows. I just wanted to meet other artists. I wanted to meet other people that was just as obsessed with art as I am because I, I, I think about it all day. I dream about it at night. You know, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, and I did, I was able to meet other artists, but 
the shows actually did really well. And then it got out that I was visually impaired and then some stories got written. And that's when the workshop started because um, when, when some stories started to be written in, in, in the newspapers and on TV, um, I started to be con- contacted by some different nonprofits and charities saying, oh, can you, can you, can you come and talk, and talk to our people? Um, can you do a workshop? And so I started doing that. I started meeting people that had all sorts of challenges, did different types of disabilities, vision loss, but also hearing and autism and Alzheimer's and soldiers with PTSD. And, and I started realizing that everybody in their life has some sort of challenge that's bigger than they are. Sometimes you need help with it, you know? So the blindness, it didn't make me different than everyone else. It made me just like everybody. Everybody has something that they need help with. And I think with the workshops, I think people get that. And the workshops are always so much fun. I, I've painted with tens of thousands of people now. And and my favorite is the blindfold workshop. We came up with that about, gosh, I don't know, 17 years ago or something. I don't know where, but it's something I still teach. And and, and we're just laughing. Everybody's laughing. And, and 99% of the people I do workshops with are sighted. They don't have a disability. My favorite are that 1%. But but I mean, I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody that's not blind or doesn't have a disability, but but uh, I mean, I just I love that. But um, but it, but it's I find it to be really really interesting. Like it seems like it opens people's eyes to what disability can be and what vision loss. Because I, I travel in with my guide dog Eagle, and she's amazing. So I travel very well with her. And then and then we're in there, and and I tell people how I paint using touch and how I distinguish color by using texture and if I find line, you know, using line touch. And people go, okay, that sounds weird, but that that makes sense, I guess. But then we blindfold them, and in five or ten minutes, they're also painting. And then there's this aha moment where they go, oh, you know, they get it. They oh, I can feel where, where the lines are. I can feel what the paint is, and I can feel the red feels different than the blue because we add these different additives to it. So it's just, it clicks to them, and suddenly their, their, their idea, their vision of what it means to have a disability and what it means to have vision loss completely changes. I've done workshops where there was this one workshop in, Gosh, I don't remember where I, I actually, but it was um, Idaho maybe. But um, that I, I went out, I went out in the hallway to get some water, and um, a mom and, and her and her sisters were there, and and their daughter was in the workshop too. They had a daughter that was about maybe 10, 10 or eleven years old, and the mom and the sister were out in the hall crying, and I was like, oh my goodness, what's happened now? So I went out there, and I was like, is everything okay? And they said, they said we're just so happy. It went, you know, they're. That, that her daughter, you know, the, the the niece of the others, was painting, and they said that they had just been in mourning because she had lost her eyesight, and they were in mourning because they just didn't see what kind of future she would be able to have, and now she's in the other room and she's actually painting, and they said it just opened up a whole new future for them, like you know what what is what is possible, and they just had to leave the room. It's just, you know, and it's just the power of art. It's just it's incredible. It, it can draw you out of yourself. Draw you out of yourself. That's very clever. I see what you did there. <laughs> how do you pick, uh, how do you decide on a subject? What are your sources of inspiration as an artist? Oh, my goodness. I meet the best people. I just meet, I, I really do. I, I don't know what it is. I, I'm so lucky, but I meet amazing people, and I love to incorporate them into my artwork. So in most of my artwork, um, it's um, it's people that I meet, and I'll fill their faces or, or, or my friends. So most of my friends will end up in my paintings. Um a lot of crowd scenes are just just different friends and people that I meet or that are in the crowd. Even if it's the back of their head, you know, it's the back of the head that I know. And I'm, not, I'm I know that's Paul. Right? I know that's you know whoever. But um, um, I had a friend that I'm um, a new friend that I felt his face the other day, and he has a swirly twirly kind of mustache, like one of those one of those big curly mustaches. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's going to have to end up in a painting. And I did a painting of the Mad Hatter, so I used his face as the Mad Hatter's face. Um, and, me, and music. Whenever I hear music, I, I see color. Um, yes. And, and that's led to, like, when I painted the 737, that was actually because it was for the Rock and Rio concert. And they uh, wanted me to paint a 737 to promote the concert. But it was because I hear music. When I hear music, I see color. And they were like, we'll paint, we'll paint whatever you want. We'll give you all the music that's going to be at the concert and go crazy. And I said, well, I can do that. I can go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there's a, a term for that condition where people can see uh, color when they hear sound. And I'm, it's escaping my mind. Oh, it's a synesthesia. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Uh, clearly one of us is in the know. Um, do you 
do you, so do, you know you you alluded to the possibility before of incorporating some dance into into art how involved are you with multimedia forms of art are you sticking more to the paint on canvas traditional route um i i mostly paint on traditionally on canvas although although tonight in my gallery like we have four sw- swing dancers that are coming in so so they're so they're going to dance and they're going to pose and people can come in and sketch them and paint them and take photographs and then and then um but I love that though because even though I, I use just just paint on canvas, I sort of my jam. I'm a one trick pony. It's the only thing that makes sense to my brain. Um, but I but I love though to be able to to incorporate the music and, and, and gesture and all 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 the different experiences that you have in life. And when you're living life, you're using all of your senses. And a lot of times with painting, we just think about it as the visual arts. But really, you know, they say art imitates life. But in order to do that. You should use all the senses. The more of yourself you can put into your art, the more you get out of it. So tonight, I'm really interested in what costumes are they're wearing, what sort of music's going to be playing. Um, I, have a, I have a DJ that's coming in that's going to play whatever they want, and so I'm curious what they want and and the other artists that are there because they they also add to to the experience and they chose things. And so I, I'm not really a multimedia artist in that I don't put a lot of different things on my canvas. But I love to be exposed to a lot of different things. So tonight, I'm so I'm hoping that we'll have lots and lots of artists with different ideas and doing things that I never would have thought of. And and it, it just I don't know. I'm very excited. So I don't know if that's a good answer. Hey, it's a, it's an answer. Uh, it's an no, answer. listen. I, <laughs> I only asked this because I just um, a few weeks ago had an interview with Clark Reynolds, who's uh, also a blind artist, but he works with Braille dots as his artistic medium. Have you ever thought about embracing Braille in your artwork? I do. I've, I've done some of that. I've done some some sculptural bra- Braille dots where I did a show in Kansas last October um, that was benefiting a school for the blind. So I came up with a painting style where you can feel the painting, but you, if you're visually impaired, you can access the painting, but if you're sighted, you can access. But then also I had Braille dots that I, I colored and I painted and that I had all ar- around the, the gallery and I've done some paintings where I'll have Braille dots coming out of it. I don't do that very often. Every once in a while I'll do that because if it serves a purpose, you know, if it if it fits what I'm trying to say in the painting, uh, I'll do that. But um, a lot of times the way that I paint, it's more realistic. The colors are crazy because the colors come from music, but, but the lines are realistic. And, and that stems from whenever I first lost my eyesight, it seems like when you're blind, a lot of times sighted people don't know what you understand. They, I mean, it's almost like they feel like you've been hit on the head. You know, so when your fa- a family member can walk into the room and they'll say, "Oh, it's your aunt," you know, so and so, and you're like, "I, I know, I know it's you. I've, I've heard your voice my entire life. You know, I know it's you." But because you're blurring, they just don't know what you understand. And so when I started painting, I wanted to paint in a realistic sort of way so people would see it. I didn't think anybody would ever see a painting, but my family, my friends that saw it, would say, "Oh, you know what, John, John, John's still in there. He still understands. He still knows." And the paintings were very simple at first, very rudimentary. It took years to learn how to how to come up with techniques to be able to shade, to be able to mix colors, to be able to do all of that. But at least the drawings were rudimentary, uh, accurate in a way, you know. And so, so even today, I still draw in a more of a realistic sort of um, way um, because I I want to express what what it is that I, that I'm that I'm viewing in my mind. But um, but the colors and all the emotions and um, it's probably getting a little more abstract as time goes on. But um... my experience with painting is very limited compared to yours. Um, um, I stopped painting around just about when I was a teenager because I lost my vision and I never really thought about taking it up again because I'd lost my vision. And uh, you used the word mourning um, and feeling a sense of loss around not being able to paint anymore. And I think that really resonated with me. Uh, but one of the things I remember from when I was painting is that what I was told was your drawings are excellent. You know, you know the, the, the sketches were excellent. But where I would get into trouble as someone who couldn't see is I couldn't color within my own sketch. And so what they started to do was they would take my sketch and have somebody else fill in the colors. because And you can probably identify with this because your my sketches were a lot more detailed because I was relying on touch. Like I would feel a human face, and so I just didn't do the, you know, the cartoon, two eyes, stick nose kind of face. Like I actually knew what a human face felt like, and that's what I put down on the sketch, and people were really impressed with that. Um, 
But uh, one of the ways in which I got around, because I didn't like that somebody else was coloring my paintings, one of the ways in which I got around this was doing black and white paintings, which seemed to work a lot better for me as someone who couldn't see. Do you find uh, this, Do you find black and white paintings attractive because there's just two colors and there's a degree of simplicity? Or do you find them challenging because with black and white paintings, you inevitably have to, you know, do shadows and things like that? Like, what's your take on that? Oh, my goodness. I, I love black and white paintings. And, and that's and that's a wonderful technique. And that's so great that you did that. that that's that's a really old technique that painters would use hundreds of years ago. That they that if you can do a grayscale or black and white painting, um, you're only having to think about, you know, the, the grayscale. So it, you can add colors later to it. Um, you can add thin colors over it, but it's a way where you're only having to think about the value. So the lightness and darkness of something. When I first started painting, I couldn't blend colors. I couldn't do any of that either. And um, so I didn't do any of that, but I, I, went, I had black, white, and red. I started with those three colors. And so all my colors were black, white, and red and never did, did, did they ever blend? <laughs> it was just black, white, or red. And then and then it, it went on from there. And I so I would add other colors until I had about twelve or fourteen colors. But I would have but I would but my paintings look more like stained glass in the in there in in the beginning. And then mm -hmm. I, so I started working out ways where I could draw lines I could feel where I start blending. <laughs> Pardon me, gosh, that's right. I got I got really excited. I guess um, I started I started blending colors. But I, I would draw like a line in the middle, so I would know. Well, I have the deepest blue here, and the, and the lightest blue is going to be over here. And I would draw a line that I could feel in the middle, thinking, well, the medium blue needs to be right here where this line is, so that I would start mixing the paint, saying, oh, this much mixed paint mixed with this much is, you know, we'll, we'll do it. It's just little techniques, but yes, that is a wonderful way. And actually, um, I have a black and white painting down here that I'm working on, and um, that, that I, it's a technique that I use today even. Um, I'm doing a, 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 a P, PBS is coming to my to my studio on Monday and Tuesday. The film, so I'm doing some paintings for them, and I needed I need to do the color kind of quick. And doing the black and white and the gray is a wonderful way to be able to work out a composition. And then later you can go in. I, I think it's so wonderful that you mentioned that too because I paint a certain way, and I've come up with a lot of different ways for people to paint. Um, but I paint a certain way, but every artist finds their own way. And I think that's, that's and, and the difference between that, between a sighted person and a non-visual person is that there is no difference. Every painter I've ever met always has their own way. And there's so little difference really between a sighted painter and a visually impaired painter. You know, if you're a sighted painter, you're going to look at the canvas with your eyes and know where you are and you can look and see where you've been. If you're visually impaired, uh, you probably use your sense of touch to be able to navigate, to get around the room. You're touching, you're trailing. So you're also going to use that on the canvas to be able to touch and feel. And, you know, what, what you can feel the, every line that you've made on, on your painting. The more that lines that you put, the more information that's there. Well, John, I'm just looking at the clock. Well, actually, I'm not looking at the clock. I have a screen reader, and it's prompting me to say that it is time for us to go. Uh, I am very uh, blue to let you go. Sorry, had to do that. Uh, but it was great chatting with you. Thank you very much, and good luck on any future projects and exhibitions that you're working on. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that so much, and and good and. And good luck with you and your art and, and everything. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've really inspired me. John Bramlett is a blind visual artist who also paints murals. I'll have to have John back because I want to spend a whole episode talking just about murals and how he goes about doing that. But that's a conversation for a future day. I do have to wrap it up today. We'll put the ways to contact us for your feedback in the description box down below. So I hope you will drop us an email or give us a call. You can find all of that in the description down below. And um, I'm going to say thank you to a couple of people who make the show possible. Matthew McGurk is our videographer for today. Marco Flalo is our technical producer. Ryan Delahanty is the coordinator for AMI Audio Podcasts. And Andy Frank is the manager for AMI Audio. And I've been your host, Joetha Gupta. Thanks for listening. <laughs>